It's international. It was an immediate rush of heat. That's all That's all I know. I didn't notice that it was um, on me from head to toe. When your body's in shock, it, it doesn't really, you know, get to you that fast. My flesh was burning. Hello and welcome to Turning Point. Let's start with things your grandmother would say. This one comes from Lucy and says, he who is not taught by his mother is taught by the world. Reminds me of that Bible verse that says, whoever spares the rod hates their children, but the one who loves their children is careful to discipline them. First up, author and speaker Laura Harris-Smith joins us via Skype to talk about her passion for helping others better understand their dreams and visions. Welcome, Laura. Hi, glad to be with you. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm happy to be in sync with your, with your colors of your home, the purple and the green. I, I, I saw it in a dream and came out running. But, um, oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> let me ask... Uh, on a serious note, the subject of dreams and visions, where did it start for you? Well, honestly, I was in a season of my life when I was having a, what I call a hearing drought. I felt like I could not hear the Lord. Uh, it was like a, a spiritual deafness. And so I just began to pray. The Lord began to just bypass my ears, you know, and go straight to my eyes. Um, and when you read in Job 33, about how God speaks to uh, some of us in one way, some or another, in a dream or a vision, but many don't perceive it. It says, and then in a dream, he opens the ears of men. So I began to notice that not only was I having dreams and visions at night, but then it began to open my ears by day. And it just brought me full circle. Wow. Now, at what point did you know that this was, these were messages from God, not just your own imaginations or your own thoughts? Well, time tells, you know, if the information comes true, if it's correct, if it's encouraging. Um, I mean, 1 Corinthians 14 talks about how he who prophesies speaks to men for their, you know, edification, exhortation, or encouragement. And so any kind of prophecy, any kind of, which I think many times dreams are, they are God merely trying to communicate to us. Um, I think it's got to do one of those things. It's got to either build up, lift up, or cheer up. And even when the information is sometimes you know, hard to swallow, uh, it still should leave peace in the end because it's just our Father trying to communicate with us. And one of the things I'm so passionate about is just helping people understand that communication is the birthright of every believer mm -hmm. uh, to be able to communicate with our Father. But let me ask you, though, for, for someone who, who desires the same gift or who is experiencing it but it's a little worried that, you know, about the source and or someone right. who's receiving the ministry thinking, well, where is this really coming from? How do I know it's coming from God? Right. Well, first of all, I never see any example in the Bible of anybody begging for a dream or anything like that. So it's not so much that as it is just having a relationship with your Heavenly Father through Jesus and praying. And then uh, as the dreams come, that's actually a really good question because I get asked it a lot. And what I tell people is that you can learn to distinguish what is, you know, your father's voice, the enemy's voice, and yours. Uh, and Ecclesiastes 5.3 says that a restless dream comes through much care or sometimes much activity. So sometimes there's going to be that restlessness or that stress that's going to bring about a dream. Sometimes there's going to be nightmares. I counsel a lot of people who have nightmares. Mm -hmm. uh, but more often than not, even those dreams we think are pizza dreams. You mm -hmm. know, what if Ezekiel had dismissed the wheels with eyes and all of that. Um, I mean, really, a lot of times we need to wake up in the morning and perceive and ask, is it God or not? Because that's what the Job 33 passage says, is that he tries to speak to a dream or a vision and many don't perceive it. I tell you what, I've got, I've got some questions that people have sent in by Facebook, uh -huh. but there's something that I really must ask you because all through our conversation, you've quoted scripture again and again, which is quite encouraging. How important is... Uh, knowing the scripture for interpreting dreams? Well, it's what sets us apart as believers. I, I went to a dream interpretation website one time. It's a secular one. And it said something like, if you dream of biscuits, you're a woman who's overly ambitious in your career or 
some kind of ridiculous thing like that. And so I set out for the book, I asked the publisher, can I create a 1,000 symbol dream dictionary? Every symbol linked back to scripture in some way. Um, and they said, are you sure you want to do that? And I was like, oh yeah, it will be fun. And then like 500 symbols in, I thought, what on earth have I bitten <laughs> off? <laughs> it, was, it really has proven to be uh, what I think is what will keep seeing the voice of God on people's nightstands, you know, long after they've finished reading it. So scripture is paramount. And uh, it's what separates us from all the other, you know, what I would call new age interpreters out there. Okay, so let me jump, jump to some questions because uh, these have been sent in, like I said, by some of our viewers on Facebook. Uh, Kutemba, Kutemba Nama in Lusaka, uh, Zambia says, how would you know that dream or that vision you are having uh, from God or the devil? And you, you touched on this already, haven't you? Mm -hmm. Well, and I always say, when you wake up in the morning, if you can't look in scripture and say, yes, this lines up with scripture or, you know, something so black and white like that, I just say, what were you left with? Were you left with terror? If you were left with absolute terror, that is not your father. Your father's not going to do that to you. If it was information, like I've had plenty of information, warning dreams. In the first two, uh, two and three, chapters two and three, I outlined the 10 types of dreams. And one of them are warning dreams. And so that's going to contain information that's not so happy, you know, but it's a warning. It's not fate. It's not set in stone. Mm. It's like the Lord just saying, look, this is what the enemy has up his sleeve. Partner with me in prayer. And so I lightheartedly tell people it's uh, like those DVDs where you can have the alternate endings, you know, and, and okay. <laughs> you can pray and ask the Lord, join with him in prayer to change things for his okay. will. Let me, let me go to Ufonobong Bassi, uh, who says, I see myself clear, climbing upstairs, but will always fall down. I don't know what it means. Mm -hmm. That is really interesting because he sees himself going up while he's going down. So what I would say is that he needs to just uh, prepare himself. I, I don't believe that our dreams are just feelings that we're having. I think that can happen, like I said, with Ecclesiastes 5.3, that restlessness and anxiety can cause dreams. But for a dream like that, if he's having it again and again, I would say that he needs to just prepare himself. Maybe there are steps that he sees that the Lord, he knows that the Lord has told him to take in life, and he keeps maybe falling down on these things that the Lord has told him to do, or it's something that's coming that the enemy is trying to keep him from progressing. And you know, that's a good example of a dream that may leave you feeling uneasy. And you're like, is that from God or, or is it not? But you know, Job 16, 14 says that the Lord counts our steps and yet does not hold our sins against us. So even if that's some sort of an admonishment, he will get somewhere. A righteous man falls down what, seven times and gets back up, you know? So as long as he stays close to the Lord, tell him, tell him if he's falling, fall forward and you never lose ground in Jesus. <laughs> Laura, thank you so much. I just got 20 more seconds. I want, to, want you to tell us real quickly uh, the, the books that you have and uh, how we can get hold of them. Well, you know, you can go to lauraharrismith.com and check out all of my books. I guess, I'm, I guess I'm most excited about this one because I offer some medical information in it. I think it's what sets it apart. And there's medical information on why we're not sleeping and why we're not remembering our dreams. There's a whole chapter on dream recall and vitamins and minerals you can take. I have a lot of scientific studies in it. So I think I'm most excited about this book right now, obviously. Laura, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, I appreciate you having me. Coming up after the break, an unemployed woman finds work through giving. Her inspiring story after this. Food was uh, scarce in the house sometimes. We became best friends with a peanut butter and jelly sandwich.
Welcome back. The woman in our next story lost everything she had, but still found the need to give. Here's her story. Letitia Thomas loves her job serving as a manager for a healthcare company. What she loves even more is raising her five-year-old daughter. A few years ago, it was a different picture. Letitia was recently divorced, had lost her job, and was caring for her baby. Not very happy with myself at that time and very unsure. Uh, but in the back of my mind, I just knew that God would provide. I just didn't know how. I was looking at my mess and said, God, how can you bless the situation? How can you help us here? And now this is too much. This is too much. As Letitia scraped by on her savings and unemployment checks, the bills became unbearable. Um, food was uh, scarce in the house sometimes. We became best friends with a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. But even in her time of need, Letitia tithed faithfully to her church, something she had started months before. I've seen God work before. Why would I stop now? Whether I'm going to tithe from my wages or from uh, unemployment benefits or a random check in the mail, I'm going to give God what I said I would give him. It came from something she learned at church. They taught a basic biblical principle about sowing and that God is really looking for your obedience. Not only that, Letitia decided to trust God and give more. Shortly after, her phone began to ring. Every time my phone would ring, it was a different job. It was a different employer saying, are you available for an interview? Letitia was offered a job. She was excited to get back to work, but soon she was ready for the next step. So she increased her giving again. One day, her supervisor came to her. She hands me a folded up sheet of paper with a job position and I applied for it. And I thought that was kind of odd that my current supervisor was showing me another job. She came to me and she said, I believe in you and I believe that you have an abundant potential to do much more than you're doing right here. Look at this position and apply. Letitia applied for the job and three weeks later. I was driving to my daughter's school when I received a phone call and I answered the phone and it's the HR director from the dream job. He said, well, I don't want to take off much, or, much more of your time, but I'd like to know if you could start this position in two weeks. I had to pull over. <laughs> I had to pull over. I was on the phone and he's like, are you there? Letitia, are you there? I'm like, yes. I said, can you give me a minute, please? I put the phone on mute and I began to shout hallelujah. I was just screaming in the car. I had to pull the car over. I was just so happy. With a new job, Letitia's salary had doubled. Today, she continues to give more and credits all her success to God's faithfulness. I had to do this. I didn't have any other resource, so I had to get to know God as my source. This is quoted all the time. Luke 6:38, give, and it shall be given unto you in good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men give into your bosom. But with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured back to you. I'm sitting here just saying, God has just been so faithful. I mean, really, I could have been anywhere else. It could have gone another way, it really could have. But God has just been so faithful. You know, the Bible says, the more you give, the more you will receive. It's good to be generous. Coming up after the break, a family is torn to pieces after a life-threatening incident. He was really so critical that they didn't have time to come to us really and tell us what was going on. They had to work on him. Welcome back. The lives of the parents in our next story were changed forever when a neighborhood bully set their youngest child on fire. Take a look. It's August 4th, 2000, day I'll never forget, going back to school after being a normal person and then going back to having burns. 
Breon Matthews' life changed forever the day a neighborhood bully offered to show him a trick. A guy in the neighborhood had approached me and asked me, did I know how to make a hole in the glass with fire? Like the robberies do, you make the hole in the glass and knock it out that way. So I was like, you know, no, I'm 10 years old, he's 13, I'm naive. So um, he goes, um, okay, well, let me show you. It was a game that would prove to be anything but fun. He um, had the hairspray uh, to a lighter. He sprayed the hairspray. He did it a couple times, so he seen that it made a, a huge torch. And the next thing I know, he sprayed it towards me. It was an immediate rush of heat. That's all, that's all I know. I didn't notice that it was um, on me from head to toe. All I noticed is that the heat that's um, surrounding me. So I um, just, just the, the agony, the pain, when your body's in shock, it, it doesn't really you know, get to you that fast. My flesh was burning. My older sister was on the porch and she, you know, see me screaming and hollering, so she went to grab my older brother and sister, who then came out of the house hollering and screaming, drop, stop, drop, stop, and that's what I heard. So then that's when they picked me up, carried me into the house, and I'm um, seeing that the flesh and skin was burned and seeing that it's coming out, so they called the ambulance. At the time, Breon's parents were on their way out of town, but they decided to head back home when they realized they had forgotten a bag. When I came home, I saw all the kids on the porch, everybody except for Breon. After learning the dreadful news, they rushed to the hospital. He was really so critical that they didn't have time to come to us, really, and tell us what was going on. They had to work on him to get him stabilized. We didn't really find out anything. This was like 5 in the afternoon. We didn't talk to a doctor until like midnight. You know, so we were just in the chapel, which was another scary feeling. I was confused, scared. Um, I wasn't aware of what was going on, how severely the situation was. It was a lot of swelling. Swelling, you know, they have to, they have to actually take off all the burned dead skin. So you go from being your complexion to basically just being pink. The doctors there had done everything they could to help Breon, so he was airlifted to a hospital for burn victims in another state. Tanya began to feel overwhelmed. Me being a mother and the, her mental state. Yeah, my mental state, how I was at the time. I didn't, I was just like unaware of where I was. You know, you're going into an unfamiliar situation, then my child severely burnt, don't know what's gonna happen, how long he has to be there. So my mental state was just all over the place. At that point, I just went blank. I lost it. Things got so bad, a hospital social worker called her husband. They were real concerned with her. So now my focus is going from Breon to her. She had had a nervous breakdown. Soon after, Tanya called and said she couldn't handle it, and she returned home. Ivory went to be with Breon. It wasn't like I was forced or had to do or anything. I needed to be up there with Breon. My stepdad, Irie, became like a dad that day. When I got burned, my stepdad took off of work and was there with me the entire time. And I had a catheter, a feeding tube, and a trachea. I had to learn to walk again, um, speak again on my own. I remember I couldn't even make a fist with my left hand, you know what I mean? Because the skin grafts were so tight and I was laying in a hospital for just, you know, months at a time. My body wasn't used to doing anything. So um, I had to learn to do a lot of stuff again. Breon's condition improved. Meanwhile, Tanya was facing an uphill battle of her own. I attended church and I believed, but I wasn't what he wanted me to be. Um, I didn't fellowship amongst other Christians. I would go sporadically and, you know, I would still go out, hang out and, you know, do things that was not of him. Finally, the hospital was ready to send Breon home but he would need a tube in his throat to help him breathe. When they told me um, about the trach, I went in my room and I closed my door and I got on my knees and I just prayed and talked to God. He was supposed to come home with the trach, but Breon don't have a scar in his throat. So I give God the glory. The family had one more obstacle to overcome. You're gonna ask me if I forgave the child that did it? I had none. Over these years, I've learned to. 
I forgave him, and I forgave him because I said, Lord, this is my child laying on his dying bed. How can I come to you and ask you to heal my child and I haven't forgiven this child? I battled with forgiveness for a long time because um, I, I didn't know, did he purposely do it? Was it just a mistake? And I just gave it to God and I just say, it does not matter. Just forget about it and, you know, and move on. And he did. Breon attended college and left the past behind. Then one day he received an unusual request. It was from the person who burned him. Maybe when I turned 18 or 19 or so, he found me on Facebook and added me on Facebook and I, I accepted him. That was a, and that was another clarification for me as well. When I accepted him on Facebook, like that's like accepting him into my life, looking at all the accomplishments that I've done with college and grad school and all these different things. That was another um, turning point for me where I knew that I no longer held any, um, you know, any grudge or anything Yes, when I accepted on Facebook. So that was another clarification for me as well. Ivory and Tanya say, it was God who brought them through the storm. You know that a man can't do these things. A lot of things happened and just right, you know? A lot of it's things, no, you know, it's no luck. It's no doctor, no nurse. No. I know it was God. Sometimes God will lay you flat on your back. Get your attention. To get your attention. He know how to sit you down to where you don't have no uh, nobody else but him. And I, I've learned that every knee must bow and every tongue must confess that God is awesome and that with him all things are possible. You know, we need to allow God to heal us from unforgiveness. And God can also heal us from unforeseen circumstances. The Word of God can make a change in our lives. I don't know if you've been through something that you found it difficult to forgive the person who did it or to forgive yourself or even to forgive what wrong you think God has done. Listen to his words now. Listen to his spirit speaking to you, saying to you, he wants to draw you closer through the situation. It might be so difficult that you think this is not possible but listen to the sound of God's voice now that says, I am God and I heal. I forgive you and give you the power to forgive others. The journey starts with a simple prayer just to get you and I to that point where we can say, yep, hands up. It's all you, God. So let's pray together and invite God into that pain. Invite him to that situation, into, invite him to that difficult thing that you're grappling with right now. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help me now to work through this situation that I'm grappling with. I've seen the story of a family who seems so unfairly dealt with, yet they found peace and found you in the middle of it all. I ask you in the middle of this storm that I'm facing relationally, mentally, physically, that you will help me to find peace and help me to find you. Help me to forget, forgive those who have hurt me, those who abuse me, those who attacked me. Help me to forgive because Jesus, you first forgave me. I ask you, amen. If you prayed with me, we'd love to hear from you. During the break, you'll find out how to reach us. Stay there, we'll be right back. If you would like to book Muyua and River Songs for concerts, ministry, and speaking engagements, just call the number on your screen or go to riversongs.com. 
Welcome back. We've reached the end of our program, but before we go, here are Lecrae and Mali Music with a song titled, Tell the World. Until next time, goodbye and God bless. I know one thing's true, yeah. I don't even really deserve to know you, no. but I, I'm a witness that you did this and I'm brand new, so I, I'm ready to go, no. and I'ma tell the world what they need to know, no. a slave to myself but you let me go, no. I tried getting high but it left me low, you uh. did what they could never do, you cleaned up my soul and gave me life, I'm so brand new, yeah. and that's all that matters, I, I ain't love you first, nah. but nah. you first love me, yeah. Come on. in my heart I cursed you, yeah. But you set me free oh. I gave you no reason to give me new seasons To give me new life, new breathing no. But you hung there bleeding You died for my lies and my cheating My lust and my greed and Lord, What is a man huh? that you mindful of him? What? And what do I have to deserve this love? Yeah. Trying to make the moments last Holding on to the past But like a hero in a dream Christ came and he rescued me Nah. But your carry kindness keep coming yeah. And your love is so unconditional Like it butterflies in my stomach uh. I got the old me in a rear view Got a new me, got a clear view uh. That was so dead I couldn't hear you Too deep to sin to come near you But you drew me in, uh. you clean me up yeah. So take me home, home. beat me up come Before on. you do, just let me tell the truth And let these folks know that I done seen your love And it's everlasting, yeah. infinite It goes on and on, you can't measure it Can't quench your love, they can't separate us uh. From the love of God, there's no estimate My face looks the same, my frame and rearranged but I'm changed, I promise I ain't the same Your love's so deep, you suffered and took pain You died on the cross to give me a new name Jesus. Ain't nothing like I seen before, I got a beam of glory I was low down and dirty, but you clean me, Lord You adopted me, you keep rocking me I'ma tell the world, ain't nobody stopping me Trying to make the moments last